Well, hello, uh, I'm David Lukoff, and today I'm going to be talking, as you can see from the title, about spiritual crises and about the DSM category of religious and spiritual problem. And I've had some involvement with both of these topics, and they're both linked. So my spiritual crisis was an experience that lasted about two months, during which I thought I was a reincarnation of Buddha, and a reincarnation of Christ, and I was here on a mission now to write a new holy book. And I'd love to tell that whole story, but it is available on YouTube, and today I'd rather use my time to give you a broader picture of the role of spirituality and mental health. But that story did change my life. It led to some challenges uh, afterwards, trying to integrate the experience. Uh, and having nightmares and horrific images like my skeleton during that time, uh, even being a little suicidal during that crisis. But afterwards, I really began to uh, do a lot of uh, research, personal experimentation with what is this domain of spirituality about. I started meditating, I started to take retreats on yoga and qigong. Uh, I also read a lot of literature and found other people who have had similar experiences to my own, describing them as things like cosmic consciousness, or Stan and Christina Groff used the term spiritual emergencies. Um, and they have many parallels throughout human history in the experiences of uh, shamans during their initiatory crises. Uh, great gurus and yogis have had gone through these kinds of personal dark nights of the soul. Uh, Jesus, Buddha, during their periods of wandering. Uh, many of the saints and desert fathers had similar experiences. So I consider this experience to be my spiritual awakening. A few years later, I started graduate school. I found out that what I had viewed as my spiritual awakening, as my episode of cosmic consciousness, would have been diagnosed in the DSM-2 that was current at that time, it was 1974, uh, would have been diagnosed as an acute schizophrenic episode. And in the current DSM-5, it would be considered a DS, uh, substance-induced psychotic disorder. Also in graduate school, I began to encounter very negative attitudes toward religion and spirituality by many of the founders of the field, such as Sigmund Freud, who argued that religion was a disavowal of reality and a hallucinatory confusion. And Albert Ellis thought that spirit and soul was horseshit of the worst sort. <clears throat> he is the founder of the cognitive part of cognitive behavioral therapy. And B.F. Skinner, the founder of the behavioral uh, therapy approach, described religion as an explanatory fiction of a miracle working mind. So later, when I was looking back at my own experience, I began to come across the work of Stan and Christina Groff, who in 1980 coined the term spiritual emergency to describe experiences like my own and experiences induced by long periods of meditation or yoga. Um, and then I actually wrote an article on how to make a diagnosis for those kinds of experiences, which I called mystical experiences with psychotic features. And this is a picture of Francis Liu, a colleague with whom I worked on proposing a new diagnostic category. And that category we called originally psycho-religious and psycho-spiritual problems. One of the arguments we made to the task force on the DSM-IV was there is now 
much more research supporting the value of religion and spirituality in clients' lives. And there's much more research showing that it is positively correlated with a lot of mental and physical health indicators. Also, it is really part of our cultural heritage, going back to shamans who would be the original doctors and healers and so on. And the earliest forms of religion, like Greek religion, had their gods, Asclepius, who were associated with healing. And even the first uh, hospitals in, the, in Europe were opened by churches. And nursing care originated in churches. So the connection between religion and health care is quite ancient. Also, in the United States, many people are very religious. I don't know if that's as true in Brazil, but in the United States, 89% of Americans report that they pray to God, and 95 to 99% claim a belief in God. So our proposal was accepted into the DSM-4. Um, it was considered a innovation. It was reported uh, with an article in the New York Times. It was uh, on several different public television shows as well as NPR radio and so on because it really meant a shift in the position that psychiatry in particular was taking towards religious and spiritual issues, showing that they are important in clients' lives and that we as healthcare professionals in fact, need to talk to our clients about these issues. So this is the actual category. I'll go ahead and, and read it out loud, and uh, presumably this will be translated. Religious or spiritual problem. This category can be used when the focus of clinical attention is a religious or spiritual problem. Examples include distressing experiences that involve loss or questioning of faith, problems associated with conversion to a new faith, or questioning of other spiritual values which may not necessarily be related to an organized church or religious institution. One of the largest growing groups now in the United States are people who identify as spiritual but not religious. So it's important to use the vocabulary of both religion and spirituality when we work with clients who may themselves self-identify as being spiritual. Uh, since that time, I've done research. This is uh, a study where I went through uh, all of the uh, uh, case records in PubMed that uh, dealt with religion and spirituality and did a content analysis. And based on that, we've identified several specific types of spiritual problems. So one type is people who have overwhelming mystical experiences, which are becoming more and more common in the, throughout the world, and that it can be so new to the person that it really throws them off balance. That can happen also following a near-death experience. There are some movies about that, how it can actually be a beneficial experience, but in the short run, people can be really challenged by the new experiences involved in a near-death experience. And many people, uh, more people are having them as, as medical care becomes more and more creative at bringing people back from the frontiers of, of dying. Psychic experiences can also uh, be uh, similar in that they can cause people to challenge their everyday concepts of reality. An alien abduction experiences are perhaps a new form of these experiences, and they have many similar qualities. We also know that many people can get into trouble with meditation and qigong and yoga because they study them on their own without a teacher. You can go on YouTube and find many videos telling you how to meditate, how to do qigong, how to do yoga. And actually, ultimately, I think that's incredibly beneficial to people 
and it's actually very good that we have those resources, but there are going to be some people who uh, take on more than they can handle in these practices, staying up all night meditating or trying to do qigong for you know, 36 hours in a row or something like that. So they, they deserve a place in our consideration of uh, spiritual problems. Possession is another uh, culture-bound uh, experience that some people have and should be treated more like a spiritual crisis than a medical condition such as a dissociative uh, disorder. So those are examples. Uh, as I said, more and more people are having mystical experiences. This is a, this is a Gallup survey done in the U.S. Uh, and you can see from 1973, 27% of people acknowledged having these experiences to the most recent that I could find, which was 2001, and 67%, almost three times as many people reporting that experience. Over time, in my personal work, focusing on spiritual problems has also led to a consideration of the other dimensions of spirituality and healthcare. One of which, of course, is that clients are also bringing their religious and spiritual strengths into, the, into their recovery and wellness and treatment. So uh, I began to want to look more broadly at an area of how mental health professionals need to work with clients' spirituality and religious beliefs in a broader way. And now I'm talking about the concept of spiritual competency. Several colleagues and I set out uh, for uh, the past 10 years to do research on what are basic religious and spiritual competencies that every healthcare professional should have. So based on that sequence, uh, we published two uh, research articles on spiritual and religious competencies in peer-reviewed journals. We've also published this book on spiritual competencies, which goes into much more detail about the 16 spiritual competencies, and I hope some of you will take advantage of that. It's available out in a Kindle edition on Amazon. Uh, just as one example uh, of these, because we don't have time to go on all of them, let's look at the skill of assessment, and that's on the right there. And this is the actual skill. Psychologists assess spiritual and religious background, heritage, experiences, practices, attitudes, and beliefs as a standard part of understanding a client's history. So when I do training, not this is a, a talk, so there's no opportunity to practice these skills, but when I, in the role of being a workshop facilitator in this area, then I would start with uh, learning how to conduct a spiritual assessment. And I will make sure that this assessment that is uh, being shown now, uh, that has been honed over a period of about 25 years of work with clients that I've done using this interview, um, I'll make sure that this is available. Um, I'll leave you with just this one question. Um, it's a question that uh, if the workshop, if this um, conference is set up, I would hope you can turn to a partner in the audience and actually ask them this question and answer it for them, which is, do you have any beliefs or practices that help you cope with difficulties or stress? This question, which is open-ended, will it allow anybody to express any religious or spiritual beliefs or practices um, and also any secular beliefs or practices that they have, such as taking walks in nature or personal meditation practices that they do on their own. Well, I wish you well in this conference, and I'm glad that you're exploring this topic of spirituality and religion, which we know 
is important in all of our lives.